Hello, we welcome you to the program today. If you would, please turn in your Bibles to Esther chapter 9. We're studying through the book of Esther, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We're studying the New King James Version. If you will, please turn to verse 1 of chapter 9. Please follow along in your Bible, and let's begin. In Esther 9, 1, to 17, we see how the Jews defeated their enemies. Verse 1, now in the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, on the 13th day, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed on the day that the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them. The opposite occurred in that the Jews themselves overpowered those who hated them. And so, the time came for the king's command and his decree to be executed or carried out. This was the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. We see this also in Esther 3, 13 and Esther 8 and verse 12. In our calendar, the date was late February or early March of 473 B.C. This was the day Haman plotted for the destruction of the Jews. The author called Haman the enemy of the Jews in Esther 3 and verse 10. It was Haman who sealed the decree with the king's signet ring to destroy the Jews, and the time had come. While Haman had been hanged, there still remained the enemies of the Jews, those loyal to the plot of Haman. With the new decree as written by Mordecai, the Jews could defend themselves against their enemies. While the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower the Jews, it was the Jews who overpowered those who hated them, their enemies. Verse 2, the Jews gathered together in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, to lay hands on those who sought their harm, and no one could withstand them because fear of them fell upon all people. In cities throughout the provinces of the king, there were Jews who lived in those cities who gathered together to fight against those who would destroy them. No one could withstand the Jews because the fear of them had fell upon all the people. Earlier, we read how many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them in Esther 8 and verse 17. Even those who did not become proselytes may have sided with the Jews. The fear of the Jews that fell upon all the people could be in various ways. Some of the people may have honored them while others were afraid of them. This would make withstanding the Jews by their enemies difficult. Consider that this for a moment. The people heard how Haman was compelled by the king to honor Mordecai, the Jew. How Haman, who plotted to destroy the Jews, was himself hanged by the king, and how the king advanced Mordecai, the Jew. The people heard how the queen herself was a Jew and how the Jews had the royal decree to protect their lives and to destroy those who would assault them. And so the fear of them fell upon all the people. Who were the people of the passage? Well, the people of the passage may refer to those of other nationalities. Verse 3, and all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, and all those doing the king's work helped the Jews because the fear of Mordecai fell upon them. The Persian authorities helped the Jews. They assisted them because fear of the Mordecai had fell upon them. The king had promoted Mordecai and so the authorities lifted up the Jews. Those who helped the Jews included all those doing the king's work. 
and this may have included military assistance. This may help to explain how they were able to do what they did. Ultimately, we know that while the name God is not mentioned in the book, God is present all along. We see his divine province in the book of Esther. When Haman spoke to the king about destroying those who did not keep the king's command, he, on, he offered to give money into the king's treasuries for the hands of those who would do the work in Esther 3 and 9. He may have referred to the king's men in that passage. Verse 4. For Mordecai was great in the king's palace, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For this man Mordecai became increasingly prominent. Mordecai was not only great in the king's palace in Shushan, but his fame spread throughout all the provinces. He became increasingly prominent. And so other versions read greater and greater, more and more powerful. And so this passage may help to explain the fear of Mordecai in Esther 9 and 3. Verse 5. Thus the Jews defeated all their enemies with the stroke of the sword, with slaughter and destruction, and did what they pleased with those who hated them. And so the Jews overpowered those who hated them, as we saw in Esther 9 and 1. They defeated their enemy with the stroke of the sword. However, their success was not due to their physical might and power. Many things contributed to their victory. The advancement of Mordecai, the fear of the people, and the help of the authorities of the provinces. Esther 9, verses 1 to 4. And again, while not a explicitly stated in all of this, we see the province, providence of, of God. Verse 6, and in Shushan, the citadel, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. And so in the city of Shushan, where the citadel was located, the Jews defeated their enemies. And according to the author, the Jews killed 500 men in the city. In verses 7 to 10, we see the 10 sons of Haman. And so the author lists the names of the 10 sons. Among those who, who were killed by the Jews. And so the 10 sons of Haman include Parshandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Abdalia, Eridatha, Parmashta, Arisii, Aridii, and Vajatha. And so the ten sons of Haman. These names were probably of Persian origin. And of those killed by the Jews, these in particular, these men were particularly significant, as recorded by the author. They were the sons of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And so they too were enemies. They too were included those who hated them. The decree permitted the Jews to plunder the possessions of their enemies. However, noteworthy, they did not lay a hand on the spoil. And so another word for plunder, they did not lay a hand on the plunder, is the word spoil. And so they did not take the possessions of the enemies who they defeated. Verse 11. On that day, the number of those who were killed in Shushan, the citadel, was brought to the king. And so the number of men killed in Shushan was reported to the king that same day. I wonder who did the reporting. Who, who brought the report of the number killed? Well, of course, the, the text doesn't say. Verse 12. And the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the citadel. 
and the ten sons of Haman? What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? And what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. Of what or what is your further request? It shall be done. And so the king told Queen Esther how the Jews had killed 500 men in Shushan, along with the ten sons of Haman. He said that if the Jews had done that here in Shushan alone, what had they done in the rest of the king's provinces? It might be argued that if so many were killed in Shushan, the place of the citadel of the king, the number killed must be far greater in all the provinces. And so the king asked Esther her request, and her, her request would be done. Verse 13, then Esther said, if it pleases the king, let it be granted to the Jews who are in Shushan to do again tomorrow according to today's decree. And let Haman's ten sons be hanged on the gallows. So Esther requests that the king grant the Jews who are in Shushan to be permitted to carry out today's decree again tomorrow. The text, the text, text does not say why she requested an additional day. It may be that there was still danger from their enemies who were active in Shushan. Perhaps she had additional information that we, we lack today. She also requested that the 10 sons of Haman, who were already killed in Esther 9 and 10, be hanged on the gallows. The people of Shushan would see what happened to those who hated the Jews. Haman had been hung on the gallows, Esther 7 and 10. His sons had been killed, and now his sons too would be hung on the gallows. Verse 14. So the king commanded this to be done. The decree was issued in Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. And so the king granted the requests of Queen Esther. The decree was also uh, was issued in Shushan, which would permit the Jews to fight their enemies a second day. Also, as requested, the ten sons of Haman, who were killed, would be hanged on the gallows for all to see. Verse 15, and the Jews who were in Shushan gathered together again on the 14th day of the month of Adar and killed 300 men at Shushan, but they did not lay hand on the plunder. And so the day of the decree was the 13th day of Adar. It was on this day that the Jews were permitted to fight their enemies and so killed 500 men, according to Esther 9 and 1 and verse 6. As requested by Queen Esther, the king, King Ahasuerus, permitted that the Jews could again act according to the decree the second day, the next day, the 14th day of the month of Adar. It was on this day that the Jews killed 300 men at Shushan. And as before, the Jews did not take any spoil. They did not lay a hand on the plunder. Verse 16. The remainder of the Jews in the king's provinces gathered together and protected their lives, had rest from their enemies, and killed 75,000 of their enemies, but they did not lay a hand on the plunder. And so the Jews throughout the provinces of the kingdom gathered together to protect their lives. The text has that they had rest from their enemies. And so this refers to how they rid themselves or got relief from their enemies. They rid themselves of their enemies. And so they had rest, having defeated their enemies, those who opposed them. This would include all the enemies, all their enemies who were killed in the 127 provinces of the kingdom. According to the passage in Esther 9 and 17, this was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. Again, as reported by the author of the book, they did not lay a hand on the plunder. Esther 9, 10, verse 15, verse 16. So while the Jews had permission by the decree to
to take the spoil of their enemies. They did not. Why not? While it's not recorded in the book, it may be the case that Mordecai had instructed them not to do so. However, the text does not say. Verse 17. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. And so on the 14th day, the month of Adar, following the defeat of their enemies, the Jews rested. They made it a day of feasting and gladness. Second, we see the days of, of Purim in Esther 9, 18 to 32. Verse 18, but the Jews who were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day as well as on the 14th. And on the 15th of the month, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. And so this passage is an account of the origins of the celebration of Purim. Uh, some people say Purim. In verse 18, the days of Shushan fought their enemies on the 13th and 14th days of the month of Adar. On the 15th day of the month of Adar, the Jews at Shushan rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. The Jews in the other provinces fought their enemies the 13th day of the month of Adar, and they made the 14th day of the month of Adar a day of feasting and gladness, Esther 9 and 17. Verse 19. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who dwelt in the unwalled town celebrated the 14th day of the month of Adar with gladness and feasting as a holiday and for sending presents to one another. While the Jews in the fortified city of Shushan feasted on the 15th day, the Jews in the unwalled towns of the other provinces feasted on the 14th day, Esther 9, 17. These unwalled towns may refer to the royal or royal towns, the open country of the land of the, of the kingdom. The Jews celebrated the 14th day, the month of Adar, with gladness and feasting and as a holiday for sending presents to one another. As they celebrated with feasting, the presents are typically understood as being presents of food. Later, Mordecai added to the custom with the sending of gifts to the poor in Esther 9 and 22. The term translated here as presence is literally, may literally be translated as portions. And so this may be referring to giving presence of food to one another. And some versions reflect that, sending portions of food to one another. However, there's nothing in the text itself that would limit, limit the presence or portions to food only. This term is found other places in the, in the Old Testament as well and in the book of Esther. Verse 20, and Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters to all the Jews near and far who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. And so Mordecai wrote these things. He recorded these events. And these events would include how the Jews had rest from their enemies. They celebrated on the 14th and 15th day of the month of Adar, Esther 9, 18 to 19. Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews in all the provinces, and this would include the Jews in Shushan and throughout the kingdoms, and throughout the kingdom of King Ahasuerus. Verse 21. To establish among them that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. And so Mordecai sent letters to establish among the Jews a yearly or annual celebration on the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. Verse 22. As the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, 
as the month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them, and from mourning to a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, of sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. And so, verse 22, the Jews would celebrate those days as the days on which they had rest from their enemies, Esther 9, 16. It was a time when they went from sorrow to joy. It was a time when they went from mourning to a holiday, to a good day. The customs which characterized the day, according to the book of Esther, would include feasting, sending presents to one another, and giving gifts to the poor. The feasting was associated with the celebration of the deliverance of the Jews from their enemies. It was a time of joy and sharing the joy of deliverance with their fellow Jews. In Deuteronomy 15, 11, Moses gave the Jews the commandment of the Lord, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your land. And so instructing them to be charitable to those who were in need. As with other holidays, sometimes people make the hol holidays out to be about drinking. Of course, this holiday, this good day, these days of Purim are about celebration of their deliverance. Certainly, the feast was not a time of revelry or drunkenness. And so while there is feasting, it's certainly not of revelry and drunkenness. Uh, Solomon warned about the dangers of wine, of the dangers of intoxicating drink in Proverbs 23, 29 to 35. So that's something to, to consider in the wisdom of Solomon. Again, in Esther 1 and 10, I think it's important to remember what happened with King Ahasuerus when he was said to be merry with wine, Esther 1 and 10. Verse 23, so the Jews accepted the custom which they had begun as Mordecai had written to them. And so the Jews agreed to continue the yearly celebration which they had begun doing what Mordecai had written to them. Verse 24, because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agiite, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to annihilate them and had cast pur, that is, the lot, to consume them and destroy them. In the presence of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, the pur, or the lot, was cast, and it fell on the month of Adar, which was the 12th month in their calendar. This was done to determine the time for the destruction of the Jews. Uh, looking back at Esther chapter 3 and verse 7, let's read that passage again. In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is the lot, before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell on the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Verse 25, of course, Purim came from the casting of the pur, or the lot. Verse 25, it says, but when Esther came before the king, he commanded by letter that this wicked plot which Haman had devised against the Jews should return on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. So Esther came to the king to save her people. The king hanged Haman, and the king authorized Esther and Mordecai to write a new decree for the Jews. Later, the sons of Haman were killed and hanged on a gallows. Esther 7, 9 to 10, and Esther 9, 13 and 14. Let's read again uh, Esther chapter 8, verses 7 to 8. Esther 8, 7 to 8, then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, 
Indeed, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay a hand on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for whatever is written in the king's name and see it with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Let's continue on. Verse 26. So they call these days Purim, after the name Pur. Therefore, because of all the words of this letter, what they had seen concerning this matter and what had happened to them. Verse 26, the author gives the origin of the name of the days of Purim. It was called Purim after the name Pur, from which Haman had cast in order to determine the day that the Jews would be destroyed. Verse 27, the Jews established and imposed it upon themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail, they should celebrate these two days every year, according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time. As written by Mordecai, as Mordecai had written, according to what they had seen and experienced, the Jews established Purim. Esther 9 and 26. They imposed the observance of Purim upon themselves and their descendants. They accepted the custom. We see in Esther 9 and verse 23. This was also the case for all who would join them. All who would join them. These would be those who joined together with the Jews to commemorate their victory. This may include those who became Jews, like we saw in Esther 8 and verse 17. And so here we see that they did so as was written by Mordecai and, and according to the time he prescribed, Esther 9, 20, 22, and 26. These two days were the 14th and 15th days of Adar. And according to the author of the book, the Jews resolved to celebrate these two days of Purim without fail every year. And so the, the observance of Purim or Purim uh, continues to this day. And among those instructions followed that are carried out, were carried out in the book, carried out today, the, the celebration, we see the, the feasting, we see the giving of gifts to the poor and of, of sharing a, a portion presence with others. Today, they also, we also see reading of the book of Esther. Verse 28, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Jews, and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. And so the days of Purim were to be remembered and kept by the Jews. This included the Jews of every family and place in the time of Queen Esther, including their descendants of every generation. Verse 29, then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel with Mordecai, the Jew, wrote with full authority to confirm this second letter about Purim. The first letter about Purim by Mordecai was written to suggest to the Jews that they should celebrate yearly the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar, Esther 9, 20 to 22. The Jews accepted that and called this celebration Purim, after the Pur or the lot, the casting of the lot, Esther 9, 23 to 28. Now, Queen Esther and Mordecai wrote a second letter about Purim they had full authority from the king 
from King Ahasuerus to confirm the second letter and make Purim official. Verse 30. And Mordecai sent letters to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus with words of peace and truth. Mordecai sent copies of the letters to all the Jews in all the provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus. The letter was written with authority. However, the letter was also sent with words of peace and truth. Yes, there was the authority. We note that Mordecai had the king's signet ring, and so he had the authority of the king to confirm the letters. But we also see besides the authority, we see words of peace and truth. There was the sincere intent for the well-being of all the Jews. And so these were words of goodwill and assurance, words of peace and truth. The word peace is from the Hebrew word shalom, and it's used today as a greeting, a Jewish greeting, and farewell. It's defined in the scriptures as peace, completeness, welfare, health, by Vine's expository dictionary. And it's most frequently translated in the Old Testament as peace. Words of peace and truth. He wanted the goodwill he wanted the well-being of the Jews. A couple passages where this word is found. Genesis 43, 23. Genesis 43, 23. But he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. Here we have the story of, of Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. Genesis 43, 23. And so he said, peace be to you. That same word is used, peace. Genesis 43, 27, 28. We see a few other examples. Then he asked them about their well-being, well-being, and said, is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke, is he still alive? And they answered, your servant, our father, is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. And so peace, well-being, good health. This is all included in, in the idea of words of peace and truth. Yes, the words were truth. They were true. And yes, the words had authority, but they also were for the peace, the well-being of the people. And so here in verse 30, we see that he wished these words to go out in this fashion. Verse 31, to confirm these days of Purim at their appointed time, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had prescribed for them, and as they had decreed for themselves and their descendants concerning the matters of their fasting and lamenting. Verse 31, the second letter about Purim here includes the matters of fasting and lamenting. Fasting, the practice the custom of abstaining, such as abstaining from food or drink. And so matters of fasting and lamenting, to lament, to mourn, to have sorrow. After receiving the first letter, the Jews may have suggested to Mordecai the matter of fasting. This letter confirmed the days of Purim and the times of fasting. Verse 32, so the decree of Esther confirmed these matters of Purim, and it was written in the book. The decree of Esther confirmed or established the matters or the words of Purim. And so this refers to the customs, the practices, the regulations 
of Purim. The matters of Purim were written in the book. You might wonder, well, what's the book? The book is not explicitly defined here in the passage, but however, I think it's most likely uh, that it refers to the book of the Chronicles in Esther 2 and 23, the book of the Chronicles. The book is also called in Esther 6 and 1, the book of the records of the Chronicles. And in Esther 10 in verse 2, the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia. And so when he says here that the decree of Esther confirmed these matters, and it was written in the book, most likely talking about the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia, Esther 10 and 2. Matters in this passage, or, or words, literally uh, words, uh, again, refers to these customs, practices, and regulations. Now, that brings us to the end of this chapter. Lord willing, we'll continue and uh, finish the study next time we have opportunity in Esther chapter 10. We hope the lesson has been helpful. As always, we encourage you to continue to study on your own. There's always more to learn. We've endeavored to stick with the text and to study what the text of the book of Esther reveals for us today. And so we invite you to come back and continue to study with us next time, Lord willing. Thank you for being here today.